This is the first of a two-part lecture on the early Renaissance, and this part concentrates on the early Renaissance in Italy. Intellectual and artistic discovery really characterized Europe's Renaissance, Renaissance meaning rebirth. And the birth of the Renaissance can really be attributed to three important factors, aside from obviously Giotto ushering it in single-handedly being the trailblazer boss that he is. We have also political and economic changes in Italy, the presence and nurturing of artistic talent, and humanism. Let's go into these three a bit further. Now we talked about humanism in the last lecture, this emphasis on expanding knowledge through education. Much of this involved reading the texts of classical Greek and Roman scholars. And notice I said scholars and not clergy people. Okay, more of this emphasis on education rather than the religion that had dominated the climate of the Middle Ages for the previous 1000 years, more or less. There's also more emphasis being placed on the individual rather than the collective. Collective meaning a group, such as a religious group. Now, regarding the political and economic changes in Italy, there were multiple political territories during this time, and they're coexisting on the Italian peninsula. And they're presided over by princely courts, which became economic and cultural centers. And these centers invested much money into the production of art, thankfully. And this was art that was paid for by wealthy families as a way of communicating their commitment to civic duty, which was an important Renaissance ideal. And remember from your notes from last lecture that humanism was also a code of civil conduct, right? So this was a very effective means for self-promotion. And the takeaway is we see that patronage continues to remain quite important. Now, it's important to promote the power of these wealthy families because, as you can see from this map, and this is the area we're really concentrating on right here, we have quite a few political entities that are coexisting in a relatively small geographic space. So there's going to be a lot of competition, economic competition, trade competition, political competition, etc. And don't forget we also have the papacy in the mix also trying to establish and promote their own political domination as well. So within all of these different political territories in Italy, we have all kinds of art production. But as you will see in this lecture, the most significant in both number and quality came out of Florence. Now regarding the presence and the nurturing of artistic talent, during the Renaissance, there was a vibrant educational system for artists, which allowed for training. And this was happening through a sort of like apprenticeship approach. And this was happening in an environment in which there was a dialogue and a free exchange of ideas. Also, many artists as part of their education began to travel, particularly to see the ruins of the classical cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. These travels further broadened their artistic horizons and, horizons and served as an important point of inspiration. This direct first-hand observation and study of classical ruins also explains why we see such a strong classical influence in Renaissance art. Let's take a look further. We've got two relief sculptures here, and these provide us with a good example of the role of patronage, right? Commissioning, paying artists to create artwork for a specific reason. Again, patronage, super important to the context in these early uh, parts of Art 201. So here's what's going on with these particular pieces. In 1401, there was a competition that was held in Florence, and it was sponsored by the local wool merchants guild. And this was a very wealthy, very powerful group of men. This competition would see who would be awarded the commission to sculpt the design for the east doors of the Florence Baptistry. This was a very important commission because of the location of these doors. These doors were located directly across the entrance from the Florence Cathedral, which was the most important church in all of Florence. Now, as you can see here, the contest involved artists working from the same theme. And what, by working in the same theme, it would make their different artistic approaches more apparent. So what the common theme was for the contest was the biblical tale of the sacrifice of Isaiah. 
This is where God ordered Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac as a demonstration of his loyalty. But just as Abraham reluctantly prepares to kill his son, an angel stops him, explaining that this was simply a test from God, not something that God actually intended for Abraham to follow through with. Now, this subject matter has some relevance. This does not appear to be a coincidence, because there's no such thing as coincidences. Uh, first of all, the sacrifice of Isaac is often compared with the crucifixion, in that the story is based upon the idea of the willing sacrifice of one son, in this case, Abraham and Isaac versus God and Jesus. Also, keep in mind during this time, Florence was in a serious conflict with Milan and was in danger of being taken over. The rulers of Florence were encouraging its citizens to sacrifice, donate money to support the military as a means of preserving their independence. So sacrifice really is the theme here. And I also think it's an interesting coincidence that when, um, when Isaac is not sacrificed, Abraham's told, you don't have to do this. God was just like testing you. Why don't you go ahead and sacrifice instead this lamb, right? And what comes off of lambs? Wool. And this is commissioned by the Wool Merchants Guild. So that's an interesting coincidence as well. Now also, finally, this theme is appropriate for the location. So the baptistry is a kind of... Um, supplemental structure to the cathedral proper and it's a place where baptism occurs. Baptisms were using water as a sort of ritual where children would be induced into the church. So this idea of kind of using one's child to access this sense of sanctity. Now let's take a closer look at this. How did these two artists treat this similar subject? Here's some things we want to think about. Let's think about the composition, how they set up this collection of images. Let's think about the communication of emotion or drama and uh, the representation of implied three-dimensional space. Now, considering these things, let me ask you a question. Who do you think should have prevailed in the contest? Take a minute, maybe pause this video, take a look, Think of who would you choose and defend that choice based on what you see in the artwork. So hopefully you did that, okay? Now, of the two, these were the two finalists in the, the contest, Brunelleschi and Giberti. Of the two, the winner is Giberti. Now this typically surprises my students and you know what, it surprises me too. Because here are the critiques that I hear, I tend to hear from my students regarding Giberti's interpretation of this theme. And I totally agree with my students. A lot of students feel like Giberti's scene is too dense. There's too much going on. It's too crowded. It's too phoby. It's confusing. Also, this idea, it's not quite as dramatic. Now, this is an important one, and I want to bring this up because it's kind of like presages some things we're going to talk about, some interpretations we're going to make from some other artworks. This idea of when exactly an artist chooses to represent a scene in a story, right? Take a look here. So here we've got Abraham. He's holding on to his son. Here's the knife, right? This angel is far in the distance flying up. Wait, hold on, right? That's pretty dramatic, but look at here. Here, Abraham holds his son by the neck. The knife is like going in, and here's the angel like holding on the arm. Wait, stop, right? That's like way more dramatic. So I think Brunelleschi definitely is being more successful here. Now, this begs the question then, well, well why, right? Why would Giberti be chosen when most people tend to think it should have been Brunelleschi? few things. Okay, first of all, keep in mind that Gibertis, in, especially in comparison to Brunelleschi's, has more of a classical influence. And this goes well with the context of humanism, which was all the rage during the Renaissance. Now, what exactly do we see here that's classical? Can you identify it? And again, maybe pause the video to look. It's really important when you um, study Renaissance art, they're able to identify these classical influences. So 
one thing we see is we see a uh, contrapposto stance, right? Poking forward knee, which is like a hallmark, particularly of Greek sculpture, showing this kind of informal relaxed position, the weight shift principle and all of that. More so though, we see the idealized male nude right here, right? Look how ripped Isaiah is, all these muscles, right? So the, the nude male form, that idea of the heroic male nude, which was very popular, particularly in Greek sculpture. And then here, this altar uh, closely resembles a Roman sarcophagus, particularly with this uh, rectangular shape. And then you've got the uh, relief sculpture in the front as well. So that's another reference back to classical culture. So much more classical, which was, again, more artistically and culturally in vogue during this time. Now, there's another thing that was in Ghiberti's favor, and it has to do with the actual construction of how these doors would be put together. So each individual panel was cast in two pieces, which conserved material and made the piece lighter overall, which would mean it would save on material costs in the end. Brunelleschi's panels were cast from many pieces, so it would have been more expensive to produce in Ghiberti's, interestingly enough. And I do not doubt that Ghiberti's being cheaper was uh, a factor in this overall decision. Now, according to Brunelleschi's biographer, Brunelleschi was so devastated by this outcome that he pretty much never sculpted again. Now, don't worry. The story does have a happy ending. Before I get to the happy ending, here it is. This is what the uh, doors ended up looking like. They're gorgeous. They're amazing. Let's talk more about Brunelleschi. So Brunelleschi, he's like, I'm done. I'm never sculpting again. And instead of creating sculpture, he starts to make architecture. And it is in this arena, architecture, that Brunelleschi made some extremely important contributions to the history of art that resulted in his commission to finish the giant dome that topped the Florence Cathedral, which again, remember, is the most important cathedral in all of Florence. So instead of creating just some doors like Ghiberti did, he pretty much created the most iconic artwork in all of Florence, which is true even today, that marks the skyline of the city. I think he probably got a much better deal than in the end what Ghiberti got. Now Brunelleschi had traveled to Rome, as we know artists were doing as part of their education during this time, and he did so to study the ruins. He took advantage of this to uh, gain knowledge about architecture, and he applied this to his structural designs. He also combined this knowledge with analytical engineering techniques. And having this knowledge was pretty helpful and probably is why he was awarded this commission, because he was faced with a really particular problem regarding this dome that no one could wrap their head around. The dome, which by the way is huge, see these little dots right here? Those are people right? So huge. Um, the dome had to span a huge space and the walls of the building couldn't support the weight of the dome. Now we know from Art 200 that the, you know, the so solution was figured out in the Gothic period. Easy, just have some external flying buttresses. They couldn't do that. They couldn't do it because the floor plan was irregular and there was also this thing, um, Florence, they couldn't build huge um, buttresses because there was a city right here, right? So this creates a problem, no flying buttresses. So you cannot um, support the walls that hold up the base of the dome from the exterior. What could be done? So Brunelleschi comes up with like the most brilliant solution of all time. First of all, he changes the shape of the dome. So traditionally, what we have with domes are low and wide, uh, hemispherically shaped. Think about the dome on the Pantheon, the most important structure ever built. Now for Brunelleschi's dome, instead of a low wide dome, a hemispherical shape, he creates this elongated dome. It's tall and has an almost like half oval shape. The significance of this shape is it reduces the outward thrust because there's a sharper distribution of weight down, makes the dome stronger. The second thing he does is he creates a double shell to the dome. And here's a drawing of it here. And this also minimizes the weight. Now what's significant, first of all, this is the first double shell dome in the entire history of architecture. Big deal. 
And what he did is he anchored the whole situation, the external shell, the internal shell, right in here by sticking this lantern in, locks it all in, kind of like the way a keystone is locked in to the top of the arch. Essentially, what he's doing is he's buttressing the dome from the inside. He couldn't buttress the dome from the outside with exterior flying buttresses, so he buttresses it from the inside with an internal shell. What brilliance. Now, one of the things we want to keep in mind is that something that characterizes the style of Renaissance art is the trend towards naturalism. And you already heard me say this five million times in the preceding pre-Renaissance lecture. The idea behind Renaissance art, this is true in both early and high Renaissance, is to depict the natural world as faithfully as possible using a very rational and intellectual approach. And of course we know that because that idea of intellectualism rationality, that would be encouraged by the tenets of humanism. Now the development of linear perspective is one of the ways that artists were able to achieve this stylistic aim of naturalism. Now with linear perspective, first of all, many people say that Giotto invented linear perspective. Now you know I would give credit to Giotto gladly and willingly if that was warranted, but in this case, alas, it is not true. Yes, Giotto in all of his brilliance was working with the idea of realistically representing the appearance of the recession of space. However, he was working with something that was called intuitive perspective, which is a feature of second style Roman mural painting. So it's an old technique that dates all the way back to classical antiquity. Intuitive perspective is based on the way we see. Primarily this idea that, you know, as we look off into the distance, things get farther or smaller the farther away they are from us. And they appear to kind of like be closer together as well. Now it was actually our hero Brunelleschi that invented linear perspective. Like he hasn't made enough contributions, right? Um, this was quite the contribution because this remains relevant even today. If you take beginning drawing, you will be taught Brunelleschi's linear perspective. The difference between linear perspective and intuitive perspective is that linear perspective is much more analytical and scientific, again, appropriate for what we've got going on during the Renaissance. It's relying also, hence the name linear, on line to suggest spatial recession. And I will tell you something, I took drawing and learning linear perspective was like literally the hardest I've ever thought in my life in any class I've ever taken. Here's how linear perspective works. A lot of terminology. So the idea behind linear perspective is that space is receding and space is receding to a point. We call this the vanishing point. Now space, it can recede in more than one direction, okay? Now in the case of this painting here, it's only receding in one direction. So we're gonna to refer to this as one point perspective. One point is identifying the fact there's one vanishing point. If space was going in two directions, that would be two point perspective. Could you guess what we would call a piece that had space receding in three points or three directions? I just gave away the answer, right? three-point perspective, and so on. We typically don't see anything beyond two-point perspective because um, it tends to make the space a little too complex for visual legibility. Now, one of the things, as I mentioned, is this idea that line is really important to uh, suggest that recession of space. Now, it's not just simply line, but more specifically implied line. Now we know implied lines are lines that the viewer perceives. They're not lines that are like drawn or actually painted in. Now here's where it gets a little confusing. When you're talking about linear perspective, you don't use the word implied line, the term. You actually use the term orthogonals. So orthogonals, okay, are implied lines used in linear perspective to indicate space receding. Now, the direction that space recedes is also important. 
two types. Frontal recession means that space recedes to the center of the work, more or less, front of the viewer. Then we've got diagonal recession, recedes from the side. Now I know I just like unloaded a bunch of stuff at you. We're gonna spend a few slides looking at this, okay? Let's look at this one, we'll start with this one. So this painting, okay? One point perspective with frontal recession. If you look, you can see the orthogonals, right? These lines that all lead here, 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 here's one. The similar tops of the arches leads here, leads here, leads here, leads here. What makes linear perspective so hard is before you even do anything, the very first thing you do is you determine your vanishing point. So this is like right around in here. And then what you do is when you put together your composition, every single line has to perfectly line up, every single orthogonal. And if you even are just a little bit off, it makes your whole piece look weird and wonky. It's really hard. So one point, all the orthogonals recede and meet in one place, frontal, front of the, the viewer. Let's look at another one. Now this one is a diagonal recession, right? One point. You can see that the diagonal or the uh, the vanishing point is off to the side of the composition, and then every single line, implied line, orthogonal, is meeting at this point here, right? One point diagonal recession. When you take your notes, right, you want to make sure that you're noting both things to really make for a complete term. You have to identify how many vanishing points and the direction in which space recedes. So here the description would be one point frontal recession. Here one point diagonal recession. Here's an example of two point diagonal recession. You can see that there are orthogonals that work um, angle this way. This is to one side. Here are orthogonals that angle this way to the other two points to the side diagonal two point diagonal recession let's practice take a look here pause the video if you need time to really try to identify the orthogonals what do we see here one point frontal recession you can see the orthogonals angling like this what about here Angle this way is one, angle this way is two. They both angle to the side, which means two point diagonal recession, right? And again, notice I am noting how many vanishing points and the direction. Now, here's a hard one. Let's see how good we are in your perspective. I put this in here deliberately because it's challenging. Pause the video, because you do need to look at this closely and see if you can determine what we've got here. Now, first of all, this is just an excuse for me to show a Kali Bot painting because he's one of my favorite Impressionist painters. It's totally an amazing painting. Um, it also is an interesting study of linear perspective. This is three point frontal and diagonal. Now I also wanted to show you this painting to show you that you can have frontal and diagonal in the same piece. Now that, okay, if you didn't get that, first of all, don't feel bad because this was hard. Now pause the video and try to figure out where these are, right? These vanishing points, these spatial recessions, three point frontal and diagonal. Okay, some of them are obvious. One, that's our diagonal. There's two, the third one is kind of hidden back in here. That's a third one, right, three point. All right, that's linear perspective. Let's move on. All right, we're gonna talk just only a very little bit about Italian early Renaissance sculpture looking at Donatello's David. Now, in terms of Renaissance patronage, the immensely wealthy Medici family, 
They were the on and off leaders of Florence for some time, and they're probably the most well-known of the wealthy uh, families that ruled over, I would say, any principality in Italy during the Renaissance. They spent vast money on art, so tons and tons of art, acquiring art from some of the most esteemed artists, but it was the artist Donatello, who created the sculpture here, that received the majority of the commissions. Now the work that we see here was commissioned for the Palazzo Medi Medici Courtyard, which was their Florence residence. And what's significant about this piece is that it is the first freestanding nude since ancient times. This is a big deal because anyone who has studied classical sculpture, uh, particularly Greek classical sculpture, knows that basically it's just like naked men all the time. And then when we have, um, you know, the beginning of the medieval period, during the Christian Middle Ages, uh, nudity was seen as indecent and that went away. So we're seeing this coming back for the first time in almost a thousand years. Now what Donatello did is he essentially reinvented the classical nude as we would have seen it in ancient Greece or Rome. In ancient Greece, we'll focus on Greece, that, that male nude, that hero would have been an athlete or a god or a warrior. But here with Donatello's piece, we have the nude taking the guise of the biblical figure, David. Now here we have David, and he's just overcome insurmountable odds to kill the giant Goliath. Now here's the story. And the, the story is something that's important to consider because it explains the appeal of David and why we keep seeing David as this kind of common uh, biblical theme being reproduced over and over. This is not the first David that or the only David we're going to look at in the uh, the Renaissance lectures. So what happened was, and I'm going to, this is like super summary, uh, there was this guy David, and he had to fight this giant Goliath. Now, obviously, he's not going to win. He's fighting a giant. He's completely physically outmatched, and he knows it. So what he does instead is he decides to not engage the giant physically, and he, um, with a slingshot, like throws a rock and that you know hits Goliath, stuns him, he falls him falls over, and then Donatello is able to uh, decapitate him, and he is victorious. Now, with this story, the the heroism, the intellectualism, this idea of using one's mind. Okay, I can't fight. What are my other options? This made David a very popular symbol to the Florentine Republic. Now, again, I want to reiterate that the nudity is associated with heroism. In this case, the heroism is applied to, to David. Um, he poses in a classical contrapposto stance, our poking forward knee, our weight shift principle, right? So here's some classical influence coming through beyond simply the subject of the heroic male noon. Now, we've got the, the musculature, right? And that musculature is really important, but here it's rather restrained than what we would typically see comparatively in a Greek sculpture. Um, you've got the nudity to perhaps reinforce the youth of the figure, um, but some of the art historians have also said, and I kind of like this, that it also reinforces the physical disadvantage that David had going up against this, um, this uh, giant Goliath. Now the Medici family commissioned this work with this particular subject matter because they wanted to show Florence that they identified with the common people. And they saw themselves as the key contributors to Florence's prosperity and freedom. Now let's talk about choice. Okay, at what moment in the story does Donatello choose to depict? He chooses after the fact. The battle's already happened. David stands victorious. He's standing on the severed head of Goliath down here. He's got on his jaunty hats. Uh, you know, with this uh, kind of relaxed pose, some sandals uh, as well. Let me ask you a question. I don't know, maybe this is just me, but do you also find that there's something sexual about this artwork? Something that might be homoerotic? Now I'm saying homoerotic because art was typically produced for the viewing and the visual pleasure of a male audience. So this is like sexual, it's sexual to appeal to men. Now, obviously we can say, okay, oh, it's sexual because there's nudity. Yeah, fine. 
But also, you know, David stands in this kind of like coy, sort of like teasing way. The head is sort of slightly cocked, sort of looking down modest, but kind of teasing, kind of not modest. You've got the hand on the hip, uh, which um, I think kind of makes this sort of implied line towards the genitalia. The stance also really pushes the hips forward. So this is like kind of first and foremost in our view. And then of course, uh, we've got a phallic symbol, right? That he kind of holds in this very interesting way. Now there's more. This is why it's always important to walk all the way around a sculpture in the round whenever you can to kind of get a full view. The back is very interesting. You have this like bird and look at its wing, like really tantalizingly sort of caressing the back of the leg and leading all the way up to just below the buttocks. Yeah. Now, how can we make sense of this? How can we make sense of this overt presentation of homoerotic sexuality? Now, there's a couple things. Okay, first, there was a strong trend in homoerotic sculpture that was popular during the Hellenistic period of Greek sculpture. Now, we know that humanism promotes a classical influence. So perhaps this is part of it, that sort of humanism interest in classical approaches. Here's another thing. In ancient Greece, okay, homosexuality between older men and prepubescent boys was common, and actually it was a representation of status. Part of the culture and the socialization of young men was a sort of mentorship relationship between wealthy um, older men and uh, wealthy young boys. The older man would show the boy the ways of the world and there would be a sexual aspect to this. So, homoerotic sexuality and the depiction of her eroticized prepubescent males, it would be a signifier of wealth and status. And it makes sense that the Medici would want to convey wealth and status and culture. As, you know, this wealth would also intimate power. Also, the homosexuality would not have been offensive to the people of Florence, aside from the church, obviously, because homosexuality was actually an accepted cultural practice in Florence during this time. Third thing, the homoeroticism may not be too far from biblical reality. There was a close and loving bond between David and Saul's son, Jonathan, one of the closest and most intimate relationships between two men in the Bible. Now, the art historian H.W. Jansen has suggested that this sculpture reflected the sexuality of the artist, who perhaps was gay. Other art historians have suggested that perhaps this um, homoerotic sculpture could have reflected the sexual preferences of the patron. Although in either of these cases, we do not have any evidence to support either of these possibilities. This concludes part one of the two-part lecture on the early Renaissance.